The first time I heard of Betty Davis, it was in college, and I was in a class that was about Miles Davis. And Did you know Betty Davis passed away two years ago, leaving fans with many unanswered questions? Since her death, rumors have been spreading about her life and final days. What really happened, and why is her family now speaking out? a pioneer, right? You kind of celebrate Betty Davis in this case um, without necessarily understanding how lonely it was, you know, how difficult it was to forge the path that she forged. Um, and then there can also be, on the other hand... Could these rumors be true, or is there more to the story? Let's dive into what her family has revealed and uncover the truth behind the mystery. The first time I heard of Betty Davis, it was in college, and I was in a class that was about Miles Davis. And Betty Gray Mabry was born on July 26, 1944, in Durham, North Carolina. She grew up with an interest in music, which started when she was just about 10 years old. Her grandmother, Beulah Blackwell, introduced her to different blues musicians, while Betty stayed at her farm in Reedsville, North Carolina. By the time she was 12, Betty had written one of her first songs, I'm Going to Bake That Cake of Love. When Betty was a teenager, her family moved to Homestead, Pennsylvania, so her father could work at a steel mill. Betty went to Homestead High School and graduated there. One big moment in her life that made her decide to pursue a career in show business happened when she saw her father dancing like Elvis Presley. It was a night, who heard a night it was, it really was. Such a that inspired her to follow her dreams in the world of entertainment. At 16, Betty moved to New York City to study at the Fashion Institute of Technology, FIT. She lived with her aunt and got a taste of the artsy culture in the city. Page where he was describing meeting her and how basically from that point on how she influenced his fashion. New York in the 1960s was full of music, fashion, and creativity, and Betty became part of it. She spent time in a trendy club called The Cellar, where many artists and musicians gathered. She played records, met new people, and made a name for herself in the city's social scene. At the cellar, she became friends with designer Stephen Burroughs, and they shared a passion for fashion and music. Betty also worked as a model, appearing in magazines like Seventeen, Ebony, and Glamour. In New York, Betty met some famous musicians like Jimi Hendrix and Sly Stone, which helped start her musical career. She became close friends with soul singer Lou Courtney, who is said to have helped her record her first single, The Cellar. Though some people question whether that single was ever released, it marked the beginning of her music journey. Betty eventually signed a contract with Don Costa, a famous music arranger who had worked with Frank Sinatra. In 1964, under her stage name, Betty Mabry, she released a single called Get Ready for Betty. With the song, I'm gonna get my baby back on the other side. She also recorded a song called I'll Be There with Roy Arlington under the name Roy and Betty. Oh, darling, I'll be there. Her first big break in music came when she wrote a song called Uptown to Harlem for the group The Chambers Brothers. Their album, released in 1967, was a big hit. But even though her music career was taking off, Betty still spent a lot of time modeling. While she was good at it, she didn't enjoy it much. She later said, I didn't like modeling because you didn't need brains to do it. It's only going to last as long as you look good. <laughs> Betty Davis met her future husband, jazz legend Miles Davis, in the 1960s. Their meeting happened in a club, which wasn't surprising, because Betty was known in New York for her love of nightlife, dancing, and connecting with interesting people. She later said she first noticed Miles at a dance concert. I saw this great looking guy in a suit, she recalled. She asked a photographer friend about him and her friend said, that sounds like Miles Davis. At the time, Betty had no idea who Miles was. When Betty and Miles started their relationship, it was clear she had a huge influence on him. Miles, who had been a leading jazz musician for almost 20 years, was starting to lose his edge as music styles changed. Betty introduced him to new genres like funk and acid rock. She also got him into the music of artists like Jimi Hendrix, James Brown, and Sly Stone. These artists were reshaping music in the late 1960s, and Betty helped Miles see how he could evolve his sound. Betty and Miles married in 1968. She was 23, 
and he was 42. Though their marriage didn't last long, just one year, it had a lasting impact on Miles' career. Betty encouraged him to experiment with his music and his fashion. She even inspired the name of his groundbreaking 1970 album, Bitches Brew. This album combined African rhythms, rock, and jazz, creating a whole new style of music called Jazz Fusion. Betty later said that while she helped inspire Miles, he had the willpower to make these changes himself. Their marriage, however, wasn't easy. Miles accused Betty of having an affair with Jimi Hendrix, a claim she always denied. Betty said their divorce wasn't because of infidelity, but because of Miles' violent temper. In a documentary about her life called Betty, they say I'm different, she opened up about the struggles she faced in the music industry. She revealed that she had been dealing with a lot behind the scenes. One of the hardest parts of her life was her relationship with Miles Davis, who she said was violent toward her. But she didn't talk about it at the time. Instead, she channeled all her emotions into her music. She wrote and performed from her heart, pouring everything she had into her songs. Although they divorced in 1969, Betty kept his last name and stayed connected to his world. After the divorce, Betty focused on her own music career. She used her creativity and connections, some from Miles' circle, to form a band. Betty's unique style and bold personality helped her stand out in the music world. While her marriage to Miles was short and stormy, it was a turning point in both their lives. Miles found a new artistic direction, and Betty began making her mark as a musician. She brought new energy and ideas to his work, and he introduced her to the possibilities of making music her own way. Betty shook up the music world for her daring lyrics and energetic performances. She didn't hold back when it came to talking about sex and freedom. At a time when many women were expected to stay quiet and proper, Betty went in the opposite direction. She was loud, proud, and unashamed of who she was. Her albums, like They Say I'm Different and Nasty Gal, were shocking for the time. Betty sang about love, power, and sexuality in a way few women dared. One of her most famous songs, He Was a Big Freak, talked openly about her sexual experiences. With lyrics like, I used to tie him up, he couldn't get enough, people didn't know what to think. Some listeners were shocked, others were fascinated, but almost everyone agreed. Betty was different. Her performances were just as bold. She would wear outfits that showed off her body, like leotards and skimpy clothing, while strutting across the stage with confidence. Betty wasn't trying to please anyone. She was just being herself. She once said, I like to be comfortable when I work, explaining why she didn't cover up on stage. Betty's lyrics weren't just about being sexy, though. They were about taking control. She made it clear that her body and choices were hers, not anyone else's. Even though people now might call her a feminist, Betty didn't see herself that way. She once said, I never thought women had power. We had power in the bedroom, but not political power. Instead of being part of a political movement, Betty was inspired by old blues singers like Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith. These women also sang about real life struggles and desires without sugarcoating anything. Betty's grandmother used to play this kind of music for her when she was young, and it stuck with her. Betty took that raw honesty and turned it into something new and exciting. Despite her talent, Betty's boldness came at a cost. One of the biggest obstacles was censorship, and it severely affected her ability to reach a larger audience. Conservative audiences weren't ready for a woman like Betty, who refused to follow society's rules. Betty's music was seen as too provocative for mainstream radio. Her lyrics, which were often about sex and desire, made many people uncomfortable. In a time when women were expected to be more modest, Betty's bold, unapologetic attitude was shocking to many. But even though she was creating groundbreaking music, radio stations often refused to play her songs. This censorship limited her audience and made it hard for her to achieve the mainstream success she deserved. Betty's refusal to conform to what was expected of her as a woman in the music industry led to even bigger problems. She was reportedly blacklisted by parts of the music industry. This meant that she couldn't get the radio play or promotional support that she needed to become a star. In the 1970s, radio airplay was essential for an artist's success. 
And without it, Betty's career struggled. She and her band toured a lot, but their performances shocked audiences, especially with Betty's bold lyrics and stage presence. Still, she didn't fit into any one category. She was a black woman playing rock and funk music, appealing to both black and white audiences. Betty caught the attention of the glam rock band Kiss. Kiss invited Betty to open for them on tour, but after seeing her perform, they realized that her stage presence was so strong they might be upstage, so they pulled back the offer. This is just one example of how Betty's powerful public persona sometimes hurt her career. Even though she was one of the most talented artists of her time, she faced backlash for being too much, too loud, too sexual, too different. Her third album, Nasty Girl, came out in 1975. But by this time, Betty's career was already losing steam. Her band began to break apart, and her fourth album, which was meant to be released, was never finished. The industry's refusal to embrace her, combined with her own unfiltered artistic vision, meant that Betty never got the recognition she truly deserved during her lifetime. One of the biggest sources of opposition Betty faced came from an unexpected place, the NONSLACP. In an interview with the Washington Post, she explained that the organization had lobbied promoters to stop her performances. The NONSLACP thought that Betty's sexually charged image and lyrics reflected badly on the reputation of black Americans. For Betty, this was incredibly hurtful. She felt that the NAACP, which was supposed to support black people, was actually trying to stop her career. She said, I wrote songs about sex, and that was sort of unheard of then. For Betty, this was an important form of expression. She was reclaiming words and ideas that were used to shame women, especially black women, for being sexually open. In songs like Don't Call Her No Tramp, Betty sang about women taking control of their own lives and rejecting negative labels. Betty often faced rumors that surrounded her image. One of the biggest rumors was that she had ties to the occult. Some people thought her mysterious aura in edgy, avant-garde style meant she was involved in witchcraft or secret societies. However, these claims were never true. It's likely that these rumors were just another way for some people to judge her because she didn't fit the usual mold of a typical star at the time. She was different and not everyone liked that. Unfortunately, the music industry didn't give her the respect she deserved. She said that people, mostly white men in control, wanted her to change. They told her to change her look, change her sound, and fit into what they thought was right. Because she refused to fit in, she couldn't get the contracts she needed to reach the level of fame that she should have. She even said that stars like her often starve in silence, meaning that even though she had talent, she was ignored by the people who could have helped her become a huge star. Betty Davis eventually left the music industry and never returned. However, her music didn't disappear. Her albums were reissued later on, and even a lost album, Is It Love or Desire, was finally released in 2009. Over time, more people began to appreciate her work and her influence grew. Today, some of the biggest stars in music, like Beyonce, Lizzo, and Janelle Monae, have said that Betty Davis was a major inspiration to them. Her style influenced many artists who followed in her footsteps, especially women in hip hop and funk. Artists like Missy Elliott, Lil' Kim, and Eve have all been inspired by Betty's fearless approach to music. By the late 1970s, she disappeared from the public eye, leaving many people wondering what happened to her. There were many reasons people speculated about her disappearance. Some believed that Betty was simply disappointed with the music industry. Others thought she had personal problems that made her step away from the spotlight. The truth is, it was a mix of both, and she chose to live away from the public for many years. In 1980, Betty suffered a huge personal loss. Her father passed away, and this hit her very hard. She went back to her hometown of Homestead, Pennsylvania to be with her mother. This was a turning point for Betty as it marked the end of her music career. She needed time to heal and care for her family. The grief from losing her father made it even harder for Betty to stay in the public eye. She had already been dealing with her career struggles and now the loss of her father added to her pain. As if things weren't difficult enough, Betty also faced mental health challenges during this time. 
It was reported that she struggled with her mental well-being after her father's death and the collapse of her music career. The weight of these combined challenges pushed Betty further away from the public. She chose to live in seclusion, away from the pressure of the industry and the media. Back to her music career, Betty recorded several songs for Columbia Records, with Hugh Mesekiela helping to arrange the music. Two of these songs were released as a single, including Live Love Learn. And you try to understand why. And It's My Life. But after Betty and Hugh broke up, she started a new relationship with another well-known musician, Miles Davis. Betty played a big role in Miles Davis's 1968 album, Phyllis to Kilimanjaro. She even appeared on the album cover. Miles dedicated a song to her called Mademoiselle Mabri. During their time together, Betty introduced Miles to psychedelic rock music and the flashy fashion styles that were popular at the time. In 1969, Betty went back to Columbia's 52nd Street Studios to record some demo songs. Miles and a producer named Teo Macero worked on these recordings. Some of the songs were written by Betty herself, while others were covers of popular rock bands like Cream and Creedence Clearwater Revival. Miles hoped to get Betty a record deal, but neither Columbia nor Atlantic Records were interested in releasing her music. The songs were put aside, only to be released in 2016 in a collection called The Columbia Years, 1968 to 1969. After her marriage to Miles ended, Betty moved to London around 1971. She wanted to pursue a career in modeling, but also kept writing music. About a year later, Betty came back to the United States with plans to record with the band Santana. Instead, she worked with a group of West Coast funk musicians, including Larry Graham, Greg Errico, the Pointer Sisters, and members of Tower of Power. Betty wrote all the songs herself, in 1973, Betty released her first album, Betty Davis. She followed that up with two more albums. They Say I'm Different in 1974 and Nasty Gal in 1975. However, these albums didn't do well commercially, although she had two minor hits on the R&B charts. If I'm in luck, I might get picked up in 1973 and shut off the lights in 1975. Carlos Santana, who worked with Betty, described her as indomitable meaning she was someone who couldn't be controlled. He admired her music and personality, calling her extreme and attractive in every way. Betty Davis had a long and interesting career in music, but she decided to step away from the spotlight after a difficult time in her life. In 1976, she finished making an album for Island Records, but it was never released. After being dropped by the label, she moved to Japan and spent a year with Silent Monks. This time helped her heal and reflect. Though Betty's music was not popular at the time, some of her old recordings were released later. In the 1990s, two albums with songs from her last recording sessions in 1979 were released. These albums, Crashing from Passion and Hanging Out in Hollywood, allowed fans to hear her music again. In 1995, a greatest hits album called Anti Love, The Best of Betty Davis was also released. In the years that followed, Betty's music began to get more attention. In 2007, two of her earlier albums were re-released. In 2009, her 1976 album was finally released under the name Is It Love or Desire? Fans and her band members thought this album was some of her best work, but it had been kept hidden for 33 years. In 2019, Betty released a new song called A Little Bit Hot Tonight, which was the first new music from her in more than 40 years. Her legacy continues to grow, with her music being featured in TV shows like Orange is the New Black and Girl Boss. Even in 2023, to celebrate 50 years since her debut album, three of her albums were re-released, along with her previously unreleased 1979 tracks. Betty Davis may have stepped away from fame, but her music still lives on today. Stayed out of the spotlight for many years, Betty's decision to stay out of the spotlight lasted for many years. She lived a quiet life, far removed from the fame and attention she once had. In 2017, a documentary showed that Betty was living a very simple life. She didn't have the internet, a car, or many things people often take for granted. She lived with only the basic things she needed to get by. 
This was very different from her past when she had a lot of success. Her lifestyle was modest and she faced financial struggles, even though she had been a big star in her younger years. It showed how life can change, no matter how famous or successful someone was. Sadly, Betty's impact wasn't fully recognized until later in her life. And even now, some critics dismiss her as too lewd or too nasty. But Betty was simply ahead of her time. She was unapologetic about her sexuality and her artistry, and she created music that still resonates today. While Betty Davis may have never reached the fame she deserved in her lifetime, her legacy lives on in the music of today's biggest artists. Betty passed away from cancer at her home in Homestead, Pennsylvania on February 9th, 2022. She was 77 years old, leaving behind a lasting impact. She was loved by many for her talent and strong presence on screen. Her death was a sad moment for those who knew her and her fans. She had spent her final days at home, surrounded by loved ones. Betty Davis will always be remembered for her work and the mark she left in the entertainment world.